she looked up at the sky, and in doing so, stepped into a dark puddle by the gatepost. Without apparently noticing it, she went on. Her heart was dancing. Success! Success! They were going to succeed! Yarrow was a small country station where the village was some distance from the railway. A car was waiting outside the station. A good-looking young man was driving it. He touched two fingers to his cap to tuppence, but the gesture of respect didn't seem to be one he was used to making. Tuppence kicked the front tyre. Isn't this rather flat? We haven't got far to go, madam. She nodded and got into the car. They drove not towards the village, but towards the hills. After taking a winding road over a hill, they took a side track that went down sharply into a deep valley. From the shadow of a small group of trees, a man stepped out to meet them. The car stopped, and Tuppence, getting out, went to meet Anthony Marsden. Beresford's all right, he said quickly. We located him yesterday. He's a prisoner. The fifth columnist captured him. And for good reasons, he's staying where he is for another twelve hours. You see, there's a small boat due in at a certain place, and we really want to catch it. That's why Beresford's not escaping. We don't want them to realise that we know what they're up to until the last minute. He looked at her anxiously. You do understand, don't you? Oh, yes. Tuppence was staring at a strange mass of material that was half hidden by the trees. He'll be absolutely all right, continued the young man seriously. Of course Tommy will be all right, said Tuppence impatiently. You needn't talk to me as though I was a child of two. We're both ready to run a few risks. And what's that thing over there? Well, the young man hesitated. That's just it. I've been ordered to put a certain proposal before you, but, but, well, frankly, I don't like doing it. You see, Tuppence gave him a cold look. Why don't you like doing it? Well, you're Deborah's mother, and I mean, what would Deb say to me if, if, if I were killed? inquired Tuppence. Personally, if I were you, I wouldn't mention it to her. Just tell me about the dangerous and unpleasant job I have to do. You know, said the young man with enthusiasm, I think you're splendid. Simply splendid. Enough compliments, said Tuppence. I'm admiring myself a good deal, so there's no need for you to join in. What exactly is the big idea? Tony pointed to the material in the trees. That, he said, is a parachute. Aha, said Tuppence. Her eyes shone. There was just one parachutist, went on Marsden. Fortunately, the LDVs around here are an alert group of men. The parachutist was seen, and they captured her. Her? Yes, her. A woman dressed as a hospital nurse. Medium height, middle-aged, with dark hair, and with a slim figure. In fact, said Tuppence, a woman not unlike me? Exactly, said Tony. The next part of it is up to you. Tuppence smiled. She said, Where do I go and what do I do? I say, Mrs. Beresford, what magnificent courage you've got. Where do I go and what do I do? repeated Tuppence impatiently. We don't have much information, unfortunately. In the woman's pocket, there was a piece of paper with these words on it in German. Walk to Leather Barrow, due east from the Stone Cross, 14 St. Alsof's Road, Dr. Binion. Tuppence looked up. On the hilltop nearby was a stone cross. That's it, said Tony. All the signposts have been removed, of course, in case they helped the enemy. But Leather Barrow is quite a big place, and walking due east from the cross, you're sure to find it. How far? Five miles. Tuppence grinned. Healthy walking exercise, she said. I hope Dr. Binion offers me lunch when I get there.
Do you know German, Mrs. Beresford? Just a few tourist phrases. I will have to be firm about speaking English and say my instructions were to do so. Well, lead me to it. We've got everything here, and a policewoman who's an expert in the art of makeup, explained Tony. Just inside the trees, there was a shed. At the door was a competent looking middle aged woman. She looked at Tuppence and nodded approvingly. Inside the shed, seated on an old box, they put on Tuppence's makeup. Finally, the policewoman stood back and remarked, There now, I think we've made a very nice job of it. What do you think, sir? Very good indeed, said Tony. Tuppence stretched out her hand and took the mirror the other woman was holding. She looked at her own face seriously and could hardly hold back a cry of surprise. Her eyebrows had been trimmed to an entirely different shape, which changed her whole expression. Her hair, pulled forward over her ears, hid small pieces of sticking plaster that tightened the skin of her face and altered its shape. Skillful makeup had added several years to her age, with heavy lines running down each side of the mouth. Her whole face now had a rather foolish look to it. It's very clever, said Tuppence admiringly. The other woman produced two slices of thin rubber. Do you think you could manage to wear these in your cheeks? Tuppence slipped them in and moved her mouth carefully. It's not really too uncomfortable. Tony then left the shed, and Tuppence took off her own clothing and put on the nurse's uniform. It fitted quite well. The dark blue hat added the final touch to her new personality. She rejected, however, the heavy square toed shoes. If I've got to walk five miles, she said, it's much better if I do it in my own shoes. Both Tony and the policewoman agreed that this was sensible, particularly as Tuppence's own shoes were dark blue ones that went well with the uniform. She looked with interest into the dark blue handbag. Face powder, lipstick, two pounds fourteen and sixpence in English money. A handkerchief and an identity card in the name of Frieda Elton, 4 Manchester Road, Sheffield. Tuppence exchanged her own powder and lipstick for the ones in the bag and stood up, prepared to set out. Tony Marsden turned his head away. He said abruptly, I feel very bad about letting you do this. I know just how you feel. But, you see, it's absolutely vital that we should get some idea of just where and how the attack will come. Tuppence patted him on the arm. Don't you worry, my child. Believe it or not, I'm enjoying myself. Rather tired, Tuppence stood outside 14 St. Ulsulf's Road, and saw that Dr. Binion was a dental surgeon, and not a doctor. From the corner of her eye, she saw Tony Marsden. He was sitting in a fast-looking car outside a house farther down the street. It had been thought necessary for Tuppence to walk to Leatherbarrow exactly as instructed. Tony, with the policewoman, had taken a different route before approaching Leatherbarrow. Everything was now ready. Tuppence crossed the road and rang the bell. The door was opened by an elderly woman. Dr. Binion, said Tuppence. The woman looked her slowly up and down. You will be Nurse Elton, I suppose? Yes. Then you will come up to the doctor's surgery. She stood back and the door closed behind Tuppence, who found herself standing in a narrow hall. The maid went up the stairs in front of her, and opened a door on the first floor. Please wait. The doctor will come to you. She went out, shutting the door behind her. A very ordinary dentist surgery, somewhat old and worn out. Soon the door would open and Dr. Binion would come in. Who would Dr. Binion be? A stranger? Or someone she had seen before? If it was the person she was half expecting to see... The door opened. The man who entered was not at all the person Tuppence had thought she might see. 
It was someone she had never considered as being N. It was Commander Haydock. Chapter 13 Would the Commander recognize her? Tuppence had so prepared herself before this meeting to show no recognition or surprise, no matter whom she might see. She felt reasonably sure that she had showed no signs of surprise when she recognized Haydock. She rose to her feet and stood there, standing in a respectful attitude. So, you have arrived, said the commander. He spoke in English, and his manner was exactly the same as usual. Yes, said Tuppence. Nurse Elton. Haydock smiled as though at a joke. Nurse Elton, excellent. He looked at her approvingly. You look absolutely right. And do you know what you have to do? Sit down, please. Tuppence sat down obediently. She replied, I was told to take detailed instructions from you. Very proper, said Haydock. There was a faint suggestion of amusement in his voice. Do you know the day? The fourth. Haydock looked surprised. A heavy frown deepened the lines in his forehead. So, you know that, do you? he muttered. He paused for a minute and then asked, You have heard, no doubt, of Sans Souci? No, said Tuppence firmly. There was a strange smile on the commander's face. That surprises me very much. Since you have been living there for the last month? There was dead silence. The commander said, What about that, Mrs. Blenkinsop? I don't know what you mean, Dr. Binion. I landed by parachute this morning. Again, Haydock smiled. Definitely an unpleasant smile. He continued, A few yards of material pushed into a bush create a wonderful illusion, Mrs. Blenkinsop. Or perhaps you would prefer me to address you by your real name of Beresford. Again, there was a silence. Tuppence took a deep breath. Haydock nodded. You've lost the game. There was a faint click, and the blue steel of a pistol showed in his hand. His voice took on a grim note as he added, And I should advise you not to make any noise. You'd be dead before you made so much as a single cry. And even if you did manage to scream, it wouldn't get you any attention. Patients who are under anaesthetic often cry out, you know. Tuppence said quietly, You seem to have thought of everything. Has it occurred to you that I have friends who know where I am? Ah, you are thinking of young Marsden. I'm sorry, Mrs. Beresford, but Antony happens to be one of our most enthusiastic supporters in this country. As I said just now, a few yards of material creates a wonderful effect. You believed the parachute idea quite easily. I don't see the point of all this acting. Don't you? We don't want your friends to find you too easily. If they pick up your trail, it will lead to Yarrow and to a man in a car. The fact that a hospital nurse of quite different appearance walked into Leather Barrow between one and two o'clock will hardly be connected with your disappearance. Very clever, said Tuppence. Haydock said, I admire your courage, you know. I admire it very much. I'm sorry to have to force you, but it's vital that we should know just exactly how much you discovered at Sans Souci. Tuppence did not answer. Haydock said quietly, I'd advise you to tell me everything. There are certain possibilities in a dentist's chair, and these instruments can cause a lot of damage. Tuppence gave him an arrogant look. Yes, Haydock observed slowly, I imagine you've got a lot of courage. But what about the other half of the picture? What do you mean? I'm talking about Thomas Beresford, your husband, who has lately been living at Sans Souci under the name of Mr. Meadows. 
and who is now very conveniently tied up in the cellar of my house. Tuppence declared, I don't believe it. Because of the penny plain letter? Don't you realise that that was just a clever bit of work on the part of young Antony? You fell into his trap nicely when you gave him the code. Tuppence's voice trembled. Then Tommy, then Tommy... Tommy, said Commander Haydock, is where he has been all along, completely in my power. It's up to you now. If you answer my questions satisfactorily, there's a chance for him. If you don't, well, he'll be knocked on the head, taken out to sea and thrown overboard. Tuppence was silent for a minute or two. Then she asked, What do you want to know? I want to know who employed you, what your means of communication with that person or persons are, what you have reported so far, and exactly what you know. Tuppence shrugged her shoulders. I could tell you what lies I choose, she pointed out. No, because I will proceed to test what you say. He drew his chair a little nearer. My dear woman. I know just what you feel about it all, but believe me when I say I really do admire both you and your husband immensely. You've got strength and bravery. It's people like you that will be needed in the new state, the state that will arise in this country when your present weak government is destroyed. We want to turn some of our enemies into friends, those that are worthwhile. If I have to give the order that ends your husband's life, I will do it. It's my duty. But I will feel really bad about having to do so. He's a fine fellow. Let me explain what so few people in this country seem to understand. Our leader does not intend to conquer this country. He intends to create a new Britain. A Britain strong in its own power, ruled not by Germans but by Englishmen, and the best type of Englishmen, Englishmen with brains and education and courage, a brave new world, as Shakespeare puts it. We want no more confusion and inefficiency, and in this new state we want people like you and your husband, brave and intelligent enemies, to be our friends. You would be surprised if you knew how many there are in this country, as there are in other countries, who have sympathy with us and believe in our aims. Between us all, we will create a new Europe, a Europe of peace and progress. Try and see it that way, because I assure you, it is that way. His voice was mesmerizing and he looked the perfect picture of an honest British sailor. Tuppence stared at him and searched her mind for an appropriate phrase. She was only able to find one that was both childish and rude. Goosey, goosey gander, said Tuppence, reciting the nursery rhyme she had last repeated while playing with Betty. The effect on Haydock was so intense that she was quite amazed. He jumped to his feet, his face went dark purple with anger, and in a second all resemblance to a cheerful British sailor had vanished. She saw what Tommy had once seen, an angry Prussian officer. He swore at her fluently in German. Then, changing to English, he shouted, "'You dangerous little fool!' Don't you realize you give yourself away completely answering like that? You can't be allowed to live now, you and your precious husband. Raising his voice, he called, Anna! The woman came into the room. Haydock pushed the pistol into her hand. Watch her! Shoot if necessary! He went out of the room. Tuppence looked at Anna, who stood in front of her with an expressionless face. Would you really shoot me? Anna answered quietly. In the last war, my son was killed, my Otto. I was thirty-eight then. I am sixty-two now, but I have not forgotten. 
Tuppence looked at the broad face. It reminded her of the Polish woman, Wanda Polonska. She had that same frightening determination. Something came to Tuppence's brain, some vague memory, something that she had always tried to remember, something that she had known but had never succeeded in bringing into focus in her mind. The door opened. Commander Haydock came back into the room. He shouted out, still very angry, Where is it? Where have you hidden it? Tuppence stared at him. What he was saying did not make sense to her. She had taken nothing and hidden nothing. Haydock said to Anna, Get out! The woman handed the pistol to him and left the room at once. Haydock threw himself into a chair and seemed to be trying hard to control himself. He said, You can't escape, you know. I've got you, and I've got ways of making people speak. Not pretty ways.